Hello again. Welcome to another session of uh, Surgical Pathology Digital Slide Review and Sign Out. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel coming to you from the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. Our project uh, is a collaboration uh, with the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy, which uh, is one of the brainchilds of the Digital Pathology Association in conjunction with PATH Presenter. Uh, here's our NCI accredited uh, cancer center, the Stevenson Center, uh, located on our campus here in Oklahoma City. The case we'll be talking about today is a 35-year-old woman who presents with an abnormal pap test. In follow-up from that, uh, she has uh, colposcopy and evaluation, which includes an endocervical curatage. Endocervical curatage specimens are amongst the, the more difficult and challenging specimens for pathologists because very often the tissue is uh, scattered widely, admixed perhaps with mucus, uh, and maybe only a few strips of epithelial cells. Here we seem to see more blue cells and more tissue uh, that makes us uh, uh, more wary and perhaps easier to locate uh, uh, the abnormality. Uh, we can see here that this uh, tumor cell, these uh, 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 cells are uh, neoplastic. They're forming some glandular spaces, some solid type spaces, um, and uh, that we have uh, a hyperchromatic nuclei um, in a pattern that is uh, uh, somewhat uh, cribriformed and so forth. So uh, this appears to be an adenocarcinoma, and uh, it's a more solid variant than is uh, sometimes seen in uh, many uh, instances. So there's a question as to whether or not this is the stratified mucinous uh, variant of uh, endocervical adenocarcinoma, or whether this is a, uh, a another type of uh, endocervical adenocarcinoma. Um, coming to cone biopsy, uh, many of these patients may have uh, identifiable abnormalities on uh, cone evaluation. Uh, and in a 35-year-old woman, uh, particularly if she uh, married later in life, there may be a desire to preserve fertility. Uh, so uh, doing a more limited procedure is oftentimes the case. Uh, here we see uh, what is uh, more typically seen in endocervical adenocarcinomas, a surface uh, type of involvement uh, with uh, altered glands. Here's a, perhaps a more normal gland here, but we see that that's quite different from the uh, adjacent gland or even from this particular small area within the same gland uh, and looking next door, we see many of the more typical high, uh, hallmarks of uh, endocervical adenocarcinoma. Specifically, we can see that there's some mitotic activity, there's some karyorectic debris, and there's considerable stratification. Looking uh, up here a little bit more towards the surface, we can see more of this stratification, uh, crowding of the nuclei, and uh, more easily recognize these uh, blue blobs of karyorectic debris and uh, mitotic activity that characterize uh, uh, adenocarcinoma. Now, in this particular location, uh, we will also, once we've identified adenocarcinoma in the surface epithelium, we want to define whether or not there is invasion. And so, of course, a complete evaluation of the lesion is important, uh, fully sectioning the cone biopsy and the, the cervix, if we have it, uh, to identify uh, invasion. Uh, that can be uh, somewhat challenging sometimes, um, particularly if it's a very focal lesion like uh, this one here. Uh, we can see that we have uh, some inflammatory reaction and we have a few small glands down here um, and then some more normal ones that are also uh, inflamed over here. So just to, again, to fix the uh, normal view of what endocervical glands look like with basal nuclei and uh, ample clear to pale cytoplasm, uh, that contrasts nicely with this gland, gland next door where we see uh, increased NC ratio. Uh, we see more nuclear uh, blue uh, stain than we see clear cytoplasmic uh, pale staining. Uh, and then we would identify and confirm that with the presence of mitoses and uh, karyorectic debris. Now, is there invasion here? We don't really see any definite invasion around these glands here. Um, uh, 
But invasion can be a tricky uh, and challenging uh, entity to dis discern in uh, endocervical uh, carcinomas. So distinguishing uh, and identifying endocervical glandular atypia first is the first challenge, then identifying invasive neoplasm, uh, neoplasia is the second challenge. And that's what brings us to our, our next specimen here uh, from the hysterectomy specimen where we see uh, that in fact we have a, a polypoid exophytic portion to this tumor, uh, but then um, with these benign uh, Nebothian cyst type glands, we see there's some extension more deeply into the stroma. Um, so when we see endocervical glandular tissue where it doesn't belong, we want to then begin to ask ourselves, what is the pattern of invasion uh, or is it invasive? And here we begin to see uh, a little bit of uh, destructive invasion. Looking here at this other area, we again see um, uh, endocervical glands, fairly well differentiated in this location uh, with uh, some preservation. But uh, as we look over here, we see there is hyperchromasia. These nuclei are much too dark, uh, much too crowded. Uh, but we're not really seeing any destructive invasion. We see just a tad bit of inflammation. Um, and so uh, based on uh, our findings and looking at things uh, here more closely, uh, we really just see these one or maybe two small areas of uh, little glands uh, streaking off uh, into the stroma. So what are the issues that uh, commonly confront us with endocervical adenocarcinoma? Well, first of all, it's important to recognize that the detection rate is less than optimal. Uh, this is not something that the PAP test is uh, optimized to detect, and uh, it may be as low as 70% uh, sensitivity. Uh, similarly, curatage can be challenging when you have a scant sample or when it's a purely in situ uh, type of lesion with just very few strips of, uh, disease, of uh, disordered epithelium. And then uh, distinguishing in situ disease from invasive disease becomes our next challenge. Um, and then with that, defining the pattern of invasion. Now this is relatively uh, more recent uh, information in the uh, literature about uh, classifying uh, lesions by pattern of invasion, uh, type A, type B, type C, and we'll go over some of the details involved with that. Um, to, and that's important because uh, each of these various patterns of invasion have a differing risk of uh, nodal metastases. Um, and that uh, can be very important when the uh, uh, gynecologist is considering whether or not they need to do inguinal or uh, pelvic lymph node dissection. And then of course, we want to make sure that we don't have uh, something else, uh, a concurrent lesion. Uh, adenocarcinoma often goes walking with uh, uh, squamous cell carcinoma, maybe with small cell in some cases, and certainly may have an associated uh, in situ epithelial lesion of a CAN type. Finally, there are some subtypes um, and subcategories that uh, may also have prognostic and therapeutic uh, implications. Uh, the largest uh, uh, distinguisher here is whether or not they're HPV-related adenocarcinoma or non-HPV-related adenocarcinoma, um, and then uh, excluding some of the more uh, significant ones like uh, clear cell carcinoma um, and endometrioid or endometrial adenocarcinomas uh, that have just extended into the cervix. Uh, so these are important distinctions. We won't go into those in great detail today, but I do want to talk a little bit about uh, these HPV types and the patterns of invasion that we can see. So pattern A is kind of illustrated here in this uh, slide. Uh, it can be fairly broad and deep, deep, but we don't see much in the way of any sort of desmoplasia. Um, pattern B and the other panels, and we'll look at these in greater uh, detail, uh, but it nicely summarizes here uh, pattern A, pattern B, and pattern C. So let's look at these in uh, some more close uh, detail. So pattern A has sort of rounded uh, nests uh, without any evident desmoplasia. You see there's uh, going fairly deep here, uh, much deeper than our normal endocervical glands, and uh, there's no response in the stroma. This is pattern A. Uh, 
Uh, pattern B, in contrast, uh, has uh, small, very limited foci. Again, it can be rounded, large areas, and diffusely invasive, uh, but the amount of uh, stromal response, the inflammatory response, the degree of uh, any identification of single cell or small glandular drifting off away from the invasive glands um, in any degree um, is a uh, cause for pattern B. And then pattern C um, is our third pattern, uh, which uh, we'll load here shortly. Uh, and as you might expect, that's the uh, further extreme of what we saw with pattern B, where it's more diffuse. There's extensive destructive invasion. We have extensive single fragmented glands, um, angulation of the glands, um, and uh, a pattern of stromal response and inflammation that is uh, uh, more extreme than we've seen in pattern B. Um, so although that's somewhat subjective to say limited versus extensive, uh, usually uh, that's not a huge problem because uh, it's a fairly established uh, feature. Now, the other thing that we've mentioned is uh, some of the subtypes, and I'll just highlight here one of these. Uh, in panel B here, we see the villoglandular subtype with these long villous uh, projections of uh, tumor uh, showing uh, very delicate fronds. And this is usually very localized uh, lesion, a very superficial lesion, most often with the exophytic type of pattern of growth. Although we have seen this pattern in conjunction with some of the other uh, more invasive uh, usual types uh, as well. We can get mucinous uh, adenocarcinoma with uh, either uh, intestinal type differentiation with sort of a goblet cell pattern as you see here in panel D, uh, as well as uh, with a, a more traditional type. Then we also have this stratified uh, mucinous, mucin producing carcinoma. Uh, which has a very diff distinctive appearance with basilar palisading and then a central uh, paler area of uh, stratified epithelial cells with uh, occasional cribriform patterns. Uh, and that's uh, very similar to what we had on our uh, curatage specimen initially is this stratified uh, type picture. Now we can also see a micropapillary uh, or inverted papillary type of pattern where you get uh, papillary structures with some separation artifact, uh, sort of uh, uh, similar to what we sometimes see in papillary carcinomas in the breast. So uh, adenocarcinoma is a uh, increasingly uh, a challenging uh, lesion because we have additional phenotypes and we have to HPV involvement and so forth. And as I mentioned, uh, we're not seeing quite the same story with uh, uh, adenocarcinoma that we saw with uh, the introduction of PAPS testing uh, and the uh, dramatic change from uh, broad distribution, high rates of uh, cervical cancer uh, to much lower rates of cervical cancer as uh, uh, PAP testing uh, became more prevalent and more widely available uh, nationwide. Uh, we went from red to blue, not politically, but uh, in terms of demographically um, in ter the uh, extent of uh, uh, squamous uh, lesions and cervical cancers uh, nationally. So uh, our summary final diagnosis, uh, endocervical adenocarcinoma, usual type, HPV related in this situation, invasive. Uh, pattern A, maybe pattern B with that one focus that we identified and highlighted, but I think overall was, was pattern A. Um, so thank you for joining us today. That uh, concludes this session. And uh, please, if you have questions or comments, uh, share them. Uh, we'd, we'd love for you to subscribe so you won't miss uh, future additions to this uh, series. And uh, we'll look forward to uh, talking with you again uh, on our next uh, video.